and um, we are right now going to, uh, Ralph is going to start. Here okay. Yeah, I'd like to apologize for that. We have no idea what's going on. And then I got kicked off by by um, the computer for some reason. I don't know why. But uh, anyway, getting back to where we were, everything Deborah said about me is true, except that since I made this slide, uh, I've actually birded in all 49 of 50 states in the U.S. The only one I haven't done is Hawaii um, uh, because, well, Hawaii is over the ocean and I've never gotten there. Um, but anyway, uh, we have uh, the, this title of this um, PowerPoint is Birds and Their Habitats on Seminole State Forest Challenges and Successes. And we have both of those challenges and successes. And uh, we're going to go through some of them right now. Uh, the bird you see here uh, on the front is a barred owl. I took that photo several years ago on the forest. Uh, the bird was just happy there staring at me. Um, and we have plenty of barred owls on the forest. They're ubiquitous, particularly in the swamps. Um, they're very common. We have them here in the land too. Um, anyway, so let's go to the second slide. Uh, there's This is me, Ralph Frisch, Biologist 2 OPS, Florida Forest Service, Seminole State Forest, Lake County, Florida. And there you have a blue growth speak that was taken by a, 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 a volunteer of ours and friend who comes out and takes photos on the forest. And he sent that one to me. Um, we have uh, plenty of blue growth speaks on the forest, not as many as a lot of birds. It comes and goes depending on the year. Some years we have almost none. Some years we have a lot. Uh, they, they spread into uh, south. When I first got here in 2006, there were almost none on the forest and only at the north end, but now you can find them all the way down to uh, State Route 46. All right, so Seminole State Forest Facts. The forest consists of about 28,000 acres in Northeast Lake County. Uh, we are currently going through our 10-year management plan and FNA, that's the Florida Natural Areas Inventory, says that we have over 30,000 acres and our uh, assessment since we just acquired a bunch of property says that we have 29,000 something. So we have to work that out with them. But uh, just guess that it's somewhere in the range of 29 to 30,000 right now. Land purchase began in the early 1990s and are, are ongoing. We have nearly 250 species of bird have been documented as seen on or over Seminole State Forest. Uh, the reason I say over is because of one frigate bird that flew over the forest and we can't document that it actually landed on the forest. So uh, so that frigate bird means I have to make this sentence longer. Uh, but it's still pretty cool. It was after the hurricane in um, uh, uh, 2017, in September 2017. Uh, Seminole State Forest is known particularly for its Florida scrub jay population, which is typically about 100 individuals at any given time. Right now we have, I think, 92 adult individuals on the forest. Uh, plus uh, this year's crop of fledglings, which has just begun fledging. Um, the habitats on Seminole State Forest um, are among among them. Uh, we have approximately 5,600 acres of scrub and scrubby flatwoods. We'll be talking about that during this PowerPoint. Uh, 6,300 acres approximately of music and wet flatwoods. Um, that's the stuff where all the palmettos grow, where you have these acres and acres and acres of, of saw palmettos with pines sticking up through them. That's uh, flat woods. Uh, music versus wet just depends on how wet the soil conditions are and therefore the density of the uh, palmettos varies with that. The wetter it is, the less there are. Um, but gallberry and um, uh, uh, fetterbush, which is Lyonia lucida, tends to go up in the wetter areas. And we have different pine, pine species in there too, depending on how wet the soils are. 5,600 acres of basin swamp and floodplain swamp. Uh, all of our floodplain swamps were logged of their uh, bald cypress uh, back in the late 1800s to early 1900s. And then most of them also were later on logged for their hardwoods, uh, uh, but they're all recovering nicely and we're never going to log them again. Uh, we have 2,300 acres of improved and semi-improved pasture and 700 acres of sand hill. Okay. Uh, take notes if you want, and we'll, we'll discuss uh, what all those mean later if you want to know what Santal is and the characteristics of it. Uh, here's a map of Seminole. Uh, all those light green areas um, are what is actually Seminole State Forest. And I have a pointer in here. I hope you all can see the pointer. Uh, the pointer I'm tracing along here is State Route 42, and north of us here is Ocala National Forest. 
which has a big scrub ray population as well, much bigger than ours. Way down here at the south end, we have State Route 46, um, and State Route 44 runs right through the center diagonal, angling from north east to southwest. And all of the light green is us. All the other colors are not us. In fact, a lot of most of it is private property. Uh, so we have uh, well over 100 miles of property border with um, other entities that are not us. And for one that's our size, that's a lot. Okay, uh, here's another uh, look at it. And you can see, again, the different types of property. Uh, the, the blues, you see the, the kind of uh, medium turquoise, not turquoisey blue, uh, I guess you'd call it periwinkle blue, uh, is uh, the lower Wakaiva uh, uh, preserve off to our east. And so we have uh, a lot of uh, additional protected lands there. And south of us, Rock Springs Run and Wakaiva Springs State Park. Plus, um, on Lake Norris, there's the Lake County Water Authority land. And, of course, we've already talked about Ocala National Forest in the north and a couple other federal lands. So we do still have a lot of other natural lands around us. Um, here's a, just a, a, a picture of the north part of the forest. And the reason I'm showing this is it's showing the different habitat types. And you can see how complex it is. Each one of those colors represents a different habitat type. Uh, for example... Scrub is the pig stuff. So this here is scrub. If you go to that funny thing that looks kind of like an axe with a blue nose up on top, that is our um, fox pens um, acquisition uh, a parcel. And you can see that is scrub. Um, and then if you go over to the far eastern side, you can see over here there's more scrub. So we have a lot of scrub, but it's broken up into some very large patches uh, with uh, ephemeral wetlands in between. And then the big yellow, that's the basin swamp we were talking about. And then we have some sand hill, which is the light green. It's, we have a very, very complicated forest, both in as far as its property lines and, and, and neighbors, uh, plus the habitats within it. It's very complex. It's, most of it is not simple. All right, on to the next slide. And there's an overall view of the forest, uh, with including north of 44 and south of 44. Um, but you can see, uh, if you can see the little cursor I have going around, I hope you can see the cursor. Uh, this okay. is a big, big area of scrub here, another big area of scrub here. And this is important. We'll talk about that later on. Because over here, we have about 1,100 acres of scrub. And down here, adjacent to that, we have another uh, 800 acres of scrub. And then way down here, we have another uh, 300 to 400 or so scrub and scrubby flatwoods. All right, on to the next photo. Oh, Kestrel box break. It's time for a Kestrel box break. Let's see if the Kestrels are using this box yet. Ooh, a pair of great crested flycatchers are using it, but no Kestrels. These are great crested flycatcher eggs. I took this photo this year from when I checked the Kestrel boxes. We have great crested flycatchers nesting in them every year, and I think they are just the most beautiful eggs I have ever seen. I, they're just delightfully good looking. Uh, they're so pretty. Um, I did have one person comment they thought they were ugly and wet looking. I'm like, I don't know what's wrong with you, buddy. I think they're beautiful. Anyway, on we go. So let's talk about the birds now. So the first ones we're going to talk about are the Bachman Sparrow, uh, Pucaea estivalis. As you can see, this is a kind of bland drab bird, but it is one of the only sparrows that we have uh, that breeds in Florida. The eastern towhee is another one. Uh, we have some uh, salt marsh sparrows, seaside sparrows uh, along the coasts, and a very small, small number of grasshopper sparrows. Uh, and, but that's about it with regards to sparrows. We're very sparrow um, uh, depleted in Florida, uh, so uh, it, which is kind of interesting when you think about it. Sparrows are one of the most common. Uh, uh, families in Brizidae in North America, but in Florida we have very few species. Anyway, on we go. Uh, the Bachman sparrow breeds and often hold year-round territories in the mesic and wet flatwoods habitats in Florida. Uh, we talked about that earlier. It mostly has um, things, uh, shrubs like gallberry and Lyonia lucida, but a whole lot of palmetto and pines. They need scattered mature pines a mid-story with a few small pines and saplings and small snags, a shrub layer with shrubs and or palmettos, and a moderate density of about one to two feet high. 
uh, a ground surface with scattered grass clumps, often wire grass, and open spaces in a complex pattern. They like that complexity and they want to have enough openness so they can forage well. Their nest is a dome of weeds and grass stems. So it actually covers up. It goes up over the top of the nest. There's a lot of ground nesting birds that nest in areas where they have pines um, and do this. For example, um, oven birds do this, but uh, that's a warbler. Um, and uh, black and white warblers do this, another warbler. Um, and uh, sometimes you'll have um, um, Eastern meadowlarks will do this. Um, and Bakken spirited. So it's it's a kind of a feature of birds that that nest in areas where there's a lot of undergrowth and typically with pines around. Um, anyway, their nest of greens, it's hidden under um, a ground among clumps. They eat mostly seeds with a few insects. Uh, Brown-headed nuthatch, Sita pusilla. Uh, these are just such wonderful birds. You hear them out there. They sound like a squeaky toy. So if you imagine your doggy has got hold of a squeaky toy with a little squeaky thing in the bottom, he's biting it, chewing it, so you'll throw it for him, and it's going squeaky, squeaky, squeaky. That's what brown-headed nuthatches sound like. Um, whoever this person is, I, I snitched this photo from the interwebs. Uh, whoever this person is who has a, a brown-headed nuthatch at their feeder is the luckiest person in the world. Uh, anyway, like Bachman sparrows, brown-headed nuthatches breed in and often hold year-round territories in mesic and wet flatwoods habitats in Florida. They need scattered mature pines, generally denser than preferred by Bachman sparrow. But remember with all of this, this is not exclusive. It, it, even though they prefer things that are a little bit denser, there's a lot of habitat overlap. So even though in one area you might have a lower density of, of uh, nut hatches, brown nut hatches, and a higher density of Bachman sparrows, that can switch should the habitat change, but you'll still have both bird species in there. A mid story with a few small pine saplings, they need more small snags than Bachman sparrows, but there's a wide overlap in these two species preferences. A shrub layer with shrubs and or palmettos and a moderate density and about one or two feet high. They eat pine seeds mostly, but with a high proportion of bark gleaned insects as well. They nest and roost in cavities. They excavate in small, semi-rotten snags, which is why they need more snags. Also, they will store seeds in these small snags. Due to a long history of fire suppression, much of Florida's flatwoods habitats do not meet the needs of Bachman sparrows or brown-headed nuthatches. Here's what we, meaning Seminole State Forest, and the Florida Forest Service are doing about it. Logging and thinning. Logging is not inherently a bad thing. It just has to be done sensibly to reduce things like ground disturbance and so forth, soil disturbance, to make sure you have a proper healthy density of trees uh, for the wildlife species that are in there and so that you don't damage uh, threatened and endangered habitat for either, species, either plant species or animal species. Um, after a wildfire or a hot uh, prescribed burn, dense stands of killed pines are salvage logged. Live trees are left, and approximately 10 to 15% of killed trees are left, too, to serve as wildlife habitat. This is something I insist on whenever we do a salvage logging. And I have to tell my bosses every single time when they go to a salvage logging sale, don't forget, we have to retain 10 to 15% of the killed trees. And then they say, but Ralph, there are snags out there already. And then I have to say, yes, but those are old snags. They're going to fall down and then there won't be any more snags. So we have to leave them. And they grumble a little bit, but they listen and they do it anyway, which is good of them. Uh, overgrown stands of pines are thinned, leaving all snags. This both puts more space between the remaining trees, but mashes down overly dense undergrowth, which makes it easier for us to burn it and burn it safely without uh, killing the trees. Prescribed fires are usually done as a follow-up. Uh, chopping and replanting. After a wildfire and subsequent salvage logging, overly dense shrubs and palmettos are roller chopped. A roller chopper is a great big drum thing, and you'll see a photo of it later on. Slash pine or longleaf pine seedlings are then planted. Uh, there's other pines that grow in flatwoods. For example, you'll get... Uh, um, sometimes on the edges you get sand pine, and you certainly get lots of pond pine, especially in wet flatwoods. Uh, but uh, we don't generally plant those. Those are happy to spread on their own, and there's too many of them uh, because the longleaf pine that were logged out back in the 1920s and 30s and 40s on, uh, on the area that became Cinema State Forest was not replanted, 
and they changed the hydrology so they didn't grow back naturally on their own and pond pines took over. So we want to reduce the number of pond pines, not eliminate it, just reduce it and increase the number of slash pines and uh, 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 longleaf pines so that we have a, a more balanced and diverse pine uh, layers in, uh, in, the, in the canopy uh, for uh, a better use by wildlife. Anyway, slash pine longleaf pine seeds are planted. After 15 to 20 years, an additional thinning and burning, uh, the area can be reoccupied by Bachman sparrows and brown-headed nuthatches, which they do. Odd exotic plant removal in exotic invasive grasses, such as Kogan grass, which is a big problem on Seminole State Forest that we really have to get a handle on, are found and treated, usually being killed with herbicide. All right, let's check in on our Kestrel box and see what's going on in there since we've got some time. Take a break, everyone. 20-second break. Hmm, it looks as though the eastern bluebirds are using the Kestrel box now. Uh, so you see these kids. These, these kids are all about uh, seven, eight days old. Uh, this egg is a, a dud egg. It never hatched, never developed. Might have been infertile or might just have died early in, just, in its gestation. Um, and uh, in about seven more days, eight more days, these guys will fledge out. All right, next slide. Uh, a prescribed fire in 2011. Bachman sparrows moved in in 2013. And this is absolutely a fact. We burned through this. Uh, it was a beautiful burn. It was one of the better ones we've done. It, we had some tree mortality, but not a whole lot. And it, it reduced the shrub layer. It came back, but it was nice and low. And bam, Bachman sparrows were in there just like that, breeding and singing away. Absolutely wonderful. Uh, burns can get quite intense. In this case, you can see how it's burning up the palmetto down here at the bottom. Um, and you can see how the uh, uh, burning up these this shrub layer, this oak here, uh, it'll top kill the oaks. Um, it'll kill live kill, but entirely kill some pines and other pines. It won't it won't kill, and they'll recover. Um, and it'll uh, burn off all the palmetto within three days. The palmetto starts sprouting new shoots, and I mean that literally within three days after the fire. And by the, the end of the next year, there's just the palmetto fronds are all over the place, but it slows down their growth. And it does kill some of them, and it does kill some of the shoots, even if the whole plant is alive. So that way we have a lower density of palmettos, and they are lower, which is better for both the Bachman sparrow and, um, and the brown-headed nuthatch. Uh, shrubs and palmettos are not killed, though, and they grow, growth is set back. But we have to work on making sure the hot spots are out. And one of the problems is uh, that when you have a... a uh, uh, an area of forest, particularly in Florida, that has been under fire suppression since the 1920s or 30s and hasn't burned in 40 years, a great deal of duff burns up, uh, builds up. So that duff is just the uh, fallen leaves and twigs and things that are slowly decaying and build up on the ground surface. And that is fuel for the fire. And so when you do a burn in an area like that, you inevitably end up with duff fires that just keep burning for days and days and days, just smoldering away. And since we don't want them to burn to the base of the pines and kill all the pines, we have to go in there and do mop up, which uh, Mike is doing right there. And an excellent job he's doing too. And there's Mike again, and here he is spraying some Kogan grass. Kogan grass is all this stuff around the outside here, around Mike. Um, and it's an invasive exotic and it forms monocultures and excludes every other plant from within it. And it, is a very hot burning fuel and will kill every tree it's around. And then you just don't have any habitat for the nuthatches and the Bachman sparrows. So though I do not like using herbicides in the case of Kogan grass and some others, we just have to, we just have to be judicious about it and cautious so we don't cause any other damage. Uh, the results are low palmettos and shrubs, grass germination from the seed bank. When you have a fire comes through and, clears out all that undergrowth, suddenly the sun can now hit the soil and the soil is now freshly mineralized. And those seeds who are just below the surface are not harmed by the fire, but now they have warm days of sunshine shining on that soil and it stimulates them to, uh, to grow, to germinate. And now we have a whole new generation of seeds that have just been sitting there for decades waiting. Uh, it's really, really cool when you see this. Uh, the low density snags, pines, 
uh, snag creation, and more open space at ground level. Here's a, a good look at that after the fire. You can see how the palmettos are coming back. This right here, this is four feet tall. That's my walking stick. You see the little pink flagging on it right there. Um, and this area also had Bachman sparrows within a year. After this fire, the very next year, they were in there singing away. It was fantastic. Um, here's a close-up of, uh, of some palmettos right after fire. You can see the darkness chart here. This is about two weeks later, and you can see how much, how quickly the palmettos come back. Uh, here's another one. You can see how charred this is, but the palmettos are like, eh, I don't care. I'll just grow back again. They're stubborn little things. Uh, this is a pond pine. Pond pines do this thing called epicormic branching. Uh, right there, and where they, after a fire, they put new uh, uh, um, needle growth and branch growth right out from under the bark where there used to be um, an old um, uh, uh, branch whorl. Um, what happens is uh, when you burn off the needles, suddenly there's a hormone those other needles produce that suppresses growth at these corms, these, um, these epicorms underneath the bark. And so that hormone goes away, and so then these uh, new needles can start growing out. Um, and you'll see a palm pine out there that's has been through a fire, and after about two years, it looks like a big green bottle brush. Um, these palmettos are way too tall and to make good habitat for either of these two bird species. So there's my – oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let's make sure I don't do that. Uh, so here's my walking stick again right in the front, if you can see it there. Um, that's four feet tall. So this is twice that. So that palm, those palmettos are eight feet tall. The palmettos used you need to be between one and two feet tall to be really healthy for the the um, Bachman sparrows and brown-headed nuthatches. Um, same thing with this. These is way too tall. Uh, it's been set back a bit. You can see because it was killed by the fire, but it's coming right up. When it gets this tall, uh, unless you burn it really frequently, the only thing you can do is walk it down with heavy equipment, and it'll come up from the root. Uh, and then you're all set. So here's a uh, longleaf pine sapling about five years after being hand planted, uh, about two meters tall. Bachman spares are now using the site because this was uh, several years before that. But there was also lots of this other forested habitat nearby. They're happy to use more open areas as long as they've got the uh, the um, uh, slightly denser pines in the background. So they'll come out to openings like this and forage and feed and sit on top of the, the newly planted pines and, and sing away to attract mates. Okay, next slide. Come on, come on, there you go. Uh, when the undergrowth is kept low and not too dense, most pines survive the fire with only a little bit of char on their bark. This all depends on how thick the duff is though. So we try to burn it if when it still has some fairly moist duff, so only the top burns off. Uh, that keeps us from killing the pines when the duff fire is spread. Um, and it's important to have snags. This is a pair of downy woodpeckers excavating a nest in this one. Uh, on the right picture, if you look right in the center on that vertical branch, there's a little knob right there. I think if you can see my pointer, I'm circling it. That's a, a male downy woodpecker. The female is inside, and he's helping her. They're switching off uh, as they're excavating their... Um, uh, their um, uh, cavity in there to have their kids. Okay, good habitat for these two bird species about two months post burn. Notice how open the ground is and that there are grasses. Uh, the flatwoods palmetto layer is too dense and tall. The slash pine here will likely be killed by a fire. So this pine, when we burn this, is a goner unless we come in with heavy equipment and walk this down first, and then we're able to uh, burn it when it's a little bit cooler and it's not likely to kill the whole thing. I tell you, though, uh, it's absolutely spectacular after a burn in some of these sp spots. Now, uh, this is uh, after a successful treatment. This is polygala rugelii, yellow milkwort. Uh, we, there was a wildfire. We salvage logged it. Um, we uh, chopped uh, the palmettos down. We did another prescriber, and then we planted a slash pine. This is about uh, six, seven years ago, um, and this is absolutely this is the two years it was like this, and then it slowly petered out. Um, but now the pines are, um, uh, you know, 
eight feet tall. We're pushing 10 feet tall. It's a nice, beautiful succession. Um, and at, at this point, when the pines are that tall, they're still a little dense, but the, we have the Bachman sparrows are using it. The nut hatches aren't yet, but we do have some Bachman sparrows using it. Uh, these are just from nearby, some brown head nut hatches nesting in a bluebird box. Uh, this is right next to that mesic flatwoods you just saw. Um, and so once that gets tall enough and the trees get old enough, so probably when the trees get to be about 20 years old, uh, the brown head and nut hatches will move right on in. <clears throat> now it's time to revisit our kestrel box. Uh, well, 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 apparently the southern flying squirrels think this is their box. They always do that. Uh, I always have them in there. Um, uh, <laughs> they're really cute. They're, they, they, they have, um, uh, they're very social squirrels. So you can have five, six, eight, ten of them in there, often a female with their kids. And they open their eyes and they look at you and they, oh, he's not a problem. They go back to sleep. Um, this one uh, is looking at me, trying to get out. Or he wants to go back to sleep. Because, of course, they're nocturnal, so I disturb them during the day, and they're not happy, but they forgive me. Whoops. Go back up. All right. So anyway, now we're moving on to let's talk uh, about the Florida scrub and its birds. So the Florida scrub jay, Aphilocoma Koryu lessons, which is the bird I specialize in, uh, we have, uh, like I said, about 100 of them on Seminole State Forest adults at any given time. This year it's a little low, uh, but hopefully we'll have good nesting success this year. The female on the left side of your screen is sitting on eggs. This is from about 10 years ago. Uh, she was a close sitter, meaning that she would not get off that nest when I came to check it. So to check the eggs and count them, I have to scooch my fingers underneath her and lift her up with the back of my hand and count the eggs with my fingers. And usually they just look at you like, what the heck are you doing? Sometimes they bite you, but it never hurts. And this is actually her, same bird. She sits there on the right with that acorn. So the Florida scrub jays are permanent residents holding year-round territories in the scrub. They need scrub between one and a half and three meters tall in small clumps with lots of openings, approximately a third of the area. Nests are placed by an opening about one meter from the top of the plant of twigs lined with sable palmetto frond fibers. They are cooperative breeders with an average of three birds per territory. That extra bird is a kid from earlier years. And they uh, that kid will help out uh, with raising his next generation of, of, of fledglings, uh, doing territorial defense, uh, helping uh, fight off the neighbors, and doing uh, a hawk um, sentinel duty. Uh, they are better in territorial clusters or neighborhoods of about 750 acres of scrub or more. Each territory averages about 17 to 18 acres. They eat arthropods, small vertebrates such as lizards and tree frogs and acorns, which they store for winter. Uh, they store their acorns in autumn and individually in the sand. They have to memorize those spots. That's six to 9,000 acorns each that they memorize the location of, and they recover two to 3,000 of those. Uh, the oaks in scrub start to produce acorns and are in usable condition for nesting from about year four to about year 10 or 12 after a treatment, depending how fast the scrub recovers. The eastern towhee, Pipilo ethyrhythmothalamus, uh, is the other common sparrow in Florida, and it, they're very common. They have lots of them, but we need them to have their habitat too. Um, and this is a, a, a male on the right, a female, excuse me, a male on the left, a female on the right. Um, they're, they're pretty cool birds. They're the most common bird in the scrub. Eastern towhees are common in many low brushy habitats across East North America, including the Florida scrub, where they are their most common bird species. They nest in low shrubs or on the ground under a low shrub. The territory sizes are about three to four acres, about a quarter of that of a scrub jay. So you can figure there's four times as many as scrub jays. Um, could occupy the same habitat. Um, they um, uh, they use many early successional habitats, with, which, of which healthy Florida scrub is one. They eat mostly seeds. 70% of their diet is seeds. What small arthropods, well, what they do, this is double foot scratch hop technique. 
and you can hear it out there and you you know it as soon as you hear it once you're used to it you know it's a toey uh for them to occupy scrub needs to be about two to about 16 years post treatment uh due to a long history of fire suppression much of florida's scrub habits do not meet the needs of the florida scrub jay or eastern toeys here's what we are doing about it Logging, chopping, and burning. All areas of overgrown sand pine in the scrub are systematically logged out by private logging companies based on a bidding process. Sand pine in most areas in Florida do not grow naturally in dense stands. The only reason they are in dense stands is because of fire suppression for so long. So removing them, clear cutting it out, resets the scrub so we can burn it and that the native, uh, the teeny plants that are there can grow back. Um, and the threatened scrub jay can live there and other things can live there like gopher frogs and so forth. Uh, logged areas are afterwards either burned or chopped or burned and chopped, chopped and burned. The initial burns are targeted to occur between October and March to prevent dense sand pine regeneration. Uh, the sand pines need a lot of moisture to germinate and grow. So if we burn between October and March, after little sand pines are up, first we kill most of them. And those that survive um, are trying to germinate in the uh, dry season in Florida. And so most of them won't. And so it slows down their uh, chance to reproduce and makes it better for the scrub jays in the long term. Chopping is done using in-house resources or conservation grants. Three areas on Seminole State Forest with over 750 acres of scrub. Uh, near contiguous scrub are our primary targets. Other areas... Adjacent to Seminole State Forest, the scrub habits that are targeted for purchase, which we have been doing. We keep working on that. We also banned as many forest scrub jays as we can, typically 85%. We conduct a complex census, a complete census. It's not really complex. It's complete. Uh, of all forest scrub jays on Seminole State Forest every six weeks for the past now 15 years. Um, uh, the next one is coming up in the first week of June. We monitor nesting success each year, and we transcope families of Florida scrub jays from the large and healthy population of Ocala National Forest to Seminole State Forest with partnership of FWC. That's the Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. This increases the breeding population on Seminole State Forest faster, and it expands and enhances the health of the local genetics because we don't need gene suppression. Uh, we don't need gene, uh, excuse me, not gene suppression. We don't need... Uh, 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 gene bo genetic bottlenecks because of limited giant uh, genetic diversity in the scrub jays. So we bring them in from Ocala and that increases our genetic diversity. Back to our Kessel boxes for another check. Let's see what we've got in there now. Jingles, what are you doing in there? Get out of there right this second. Stupid cat. Jeez. You can't take him anywhere. Overgrown scrub. This needs to be treated. Here's my walking stick again right there in the front. That's four feet tall, as you can see. Uh, that's eight feet tall right there. And if you go up there, that's another. So this is 12 foot tall scrub. Way too tall. Uh, way too dense. So we do things like roller chopping. You can see the equipment here in the background. This has been roller chop. Uh, this was done in, in September 2015. Now it is occupied by Florida scrub jays. This is what the uh, skitter and roller chopper looks like. This machine in front is the skitter. It has these large tires, which are low ground pressure, so it reduces soil disturbance, which we, a little surficial disturbance isn't a problem. That's natural. We just don't want it to be deep. So this helps prevent soil disturbance. And this is the chopper in the background. You see these blades running across it. That's what chops up the material, so it's easier to burn. And then we do a burn. It's called stringing fire. This gentleman's using a drip torch, which is a mix of diesel fuel and gasoline. Three quarters diesel, one quarter gasoline. Uh, burns beautifully, and he we light it and we just drip it in line, and it burns up, and it'll kill all of these overgrown sand pines here, which is a good thing. Um, other things we do is we have aerial ignition devices. This is me. This is our machine, and it spits little balls out here out of the bottom. See up there in the helicopter sitting up there? It spits little balls uh, out of the bottom down here that have uh, potassium permanganate in them injected with ethylene glycol. Yes, ethylene glycol is the stuff you put in your, your radiator to cool your vehicle. Um, 
uh, and the two react and it sets these little plastic ping pong balls on fire after they hit the ground. And it's a lot more efficient to burn that way than stringing fire you saw before. So if we have a large area to burn, this is the way to go. Though now we use drones too, which is also pretty cool. Recently chopped and burned scrub with more burning in the distance, November 2015. So this is that September photo I showed you earlier where the chopping was. This is what was done later to it. It was burned. So all of this was burned. You can see the chop lines here where the chopper came through down at the bottom of the left picture. That smoke column is another area that was chopped under the same uh, grant that we got. Contract was $49,000 grant. So that one's being burned too. And this is another photo of it. And a little bit too much soil disturbance here on the edge, but you get farther back, there isn't any. So we did a pretty good job with this one. Anywho, went too far. Let's try this now. Uh, after burn, wildfires often germinate in abundance from the seed bank. Look at these liatris. The absolutely beautiful liatris bloom from about August through late October and they're spectacular and yes as soon as you get in there and do this burn suddenly all these light seeds that have been sitting in the seed bank just burst into life and it's just absolutely fantastic you can see how low this is back here this is about two years after the burn um these are still the dead uh upright dead things that were not chopped um, but the light don't care they're back and happy um sand pine cones uh, they disperse abundant seeds after chopping our log and the new seedlings need to be burned and that's why we do the first burn uh, sometime in uh, october to march in the dry season um, the cones as you can see are all closed they are they're called serotonous cones they're held together with a uh, resin a natural resin they can be viable on the tree for 30 years with viable seeds in them but when the heat of the fire comes through, it open, kills the adult tree, opens up the, the cones, and the seeds fall on freshly mineralized soil after a few days. Saw palmetto and their fibers used by the jays to line their nests. Only these fibers, that's the only thing scrub jays will use to line their nests, which is pretty cool. Um, High-quality floor scrub currently used by floor scrub jays, chopped and burned in 2012. This is perfect scrub habitat, and the jays are in there. This is one of the jays that was translocated from Ocala, uh, it's receiving his radio transmitter uh, right now. Um, they'll take this hood off him, and then he gets released onto Seminole State Forest. And this bird did quite well. He has had breeding success on Seminole State Forest, um, as, which is makes me very happy. Um, at the time, we we're using these soft release cages, uh, so the the uh, birds acclimatize themselves in the cages. Um, uh, so that's step one, install K, step two, add J's and mix thoroughly and cook at low temp. Um, and as you can see, FWC personnel are doing this as well as full or four service personnel. And it was a pretty, pretty successful. On to the next one. Uh, how the heck did we end up in here? Beats me. Ooh, but look, there's peanuts. That's right. For the few days after we release them, we give them free peanuts. We supplement their food supply because they're new here. They don't know what foods are available. So we supplement their food supply for a few days to a week before they acclimatize themselves. Um, this is me banding birds. This is called the birder's grip where you have the two fingers, one around like a peace sign going around the bird's neck and you hold the breast and then the thumb. Uh, and you see his little paws here, his feet are held together. I place one foot in the other and they automatically grasp down it makes them feel like they're doing something and they struggle less so I can ban them more easily. This is a bird in early September. You see how pretty and blue his feathers are? They're nice new feathers. Um, and this is more banding. So I use um, uh, six, uh, excuse me, four bands on each bird, three color bands, one, two, three, and an aluminum band, which you can see up here above. And on this bird, it's different. We have a a silver band here, aluminum band. Above that, you can't see it as another color band, and then blue and yellow. On the left leg, you see both cases. The upper band on the blue, on the left leg is blue. Uh, that indicates the bird was banded on Seminole State Forest. So if they go anyplace else and any other land manager finds them, they'll know where it came from. Thank you for all your help, Mr. Ralph. No problem, ma'am. I'm happy to do it. Uh, perhaps now the castles will be using the box. Let's take a look. Nope, eastern screech owls uh, are there. Uh, what gives? Why aren't there any kestrels? Uh, yeah, I, eastern baby screech owls are just the cutest things in the world. Little white 
balls of fluff. They're just so cute. All right. Anyway, our habitat, our last habitat, improved pasture and associated habitat. It's not a natural habitat, obviously, but that doesn't mean it doesn't attract natural birds. And so we want to make sure that even if the habitat is not a natural habitat, it's good for native birds. Improved pasture on Seminole State Forest is used by the Southeastern American Kestrel, Falco sparvarius polis, the loggerhead shrike, Lanius ludovicianus. Isn't he a beautiful bird? I love these birds. They're so cool. Look at that mask, that black mask. That's awesome. Uh, the reason they have that black mask like that, it hides their black eye. And so their prey can't see that something is looking at them. And so it makes it easier for the shrikes to go down and get their prey because they don't know that they've been seen. Um, and Eastern Meadowlark, Sterna Magna, Sternella Magna. Also beautiful birds. Um, all three of these species use improved pasture on Seminole State Forest, but in a different way. Kestrels like the grasses low with open patches for their foraging. The females, which is the larger the pair, prefer the pastures. Males prefer open park-like sandhill with scattered trees. We don't have a whole lot of sandhill on Seminole State Forest, but we have enough that we have kestrels breeding. Uh, they nest in old woodpecker cavity snags or kestrel boxes. They eat lizards, insects, some small mammals, and small birds. The shrikes prefer the same ground cover. They need scattered low shrubs, one to three meters tall for nesting, and thorns or barbed wire to store their chow. Uh, they eat the same stuff as kestrels. Uh, they need a post or snag for perching. Meadow larks like the same ground conditions. They nest on the ground under tussocks of grass, sometimes weaving a grassy roof for their nest. They need perches too. They glean insects from the ground mostly. We manage our habitat by keeping the pasture and grazing leases whenever possible. We have fairly low densities of cattle when we do that, so they usually don't disturb the birds. Very rarely they might, but usually they don't, so we still have good nesting success. We have lots of all three of these, of, of shrikes and the meadowlarks. Not so many kestrels because they're threatened species, but the other two are doing fine because of our pastures. Mowing the pastures periodically when not under grazing lease, doing prescribed burns every few years to maintain low growth, controlling and eliminating invasive exotic species such as cogan grass and natal grass, tropical soda apple, and installing nest boxes for the kestrels. So dog fennel is a, a native plant, and it is a really cool plant. It's a very impressive plant, but it comes back very densely in disturbed areas. It likes disturbance. Um, and every time you mow a pasture, if cattle come through, that's disturbance. And so it can be a big problem. Uh, so we have to keep it mowed if we want the bird species in there. Um, typical kestrels pasture on Seminole State Forest, capable of sustaining cattle, kestrel strikes, and meadowlarks. You can see how open it is, but it's got the wood line along the edge and a few um, clumps of trees for the nesting of the shrikes. has barbed wire here for the shrikes to stick their larder on and uh, places for the kestrels to nest. Uh, our oak pastures often have scattered very large live oaks to make excellent kestrel perches, shrike perches too, though they prefer lower ones. Eastern prickly pear cactus are common in pastures but rarely cause a problem. In fact, they generally don't, and sometimes the meadow larks will nest under them. Uh, some pastures have more trees than others, which is good for the kestrels. And of course, there's cattle. The moo cows find my kestrel box checks fascinating. If there's cattle out there and I'm checking the kestrel boxes, they'll show up and look at me just in the hopes that I'm bringing them something to eat. Uh, there I am. I'm checking a kestrel box. We currently have 10 up on the forest. And this is what shrikes do. Uh, shrikes like to store their larder on barbed wire. Here's a grasshopper and an American animal stuck on the barbed wire. Um, and here's the next one. Uh, be ready for it. Don't freak out. There's a, a big cockroach that they got and put on the barbed wire. And this is actually at the airport in the land. Um, and this is a, a, a yellow rumped warbler that the shrikes got and are storing on the wire for later. So they can get small birds. Let's check our kestrel boxes one last time. Could it be? Could it be? It is kestrel eggs. So kestrel eggs um, in Florida, almost all of them that I've found, in fact, all of them that I've found have been brown speckled like this, though in other areas uh, they can be entirely white. Uh, white eggs 
of species are common in in um, uh, cavity nesting species only because when you're in a cavity, you don't really need to hide your eggs. So if you find a species that has some that nests in cavity that has some eggs that are dark and some eggs that are, are white, it's one that is slowly evolving out of having brown eggs. So that means they used to nest not in cavities, but in the open, the species did. And there's mom sitting there in the background. Uh, yeah, yeah, so there's proof. See, we have kestrels on, on semel safe forest breeding. And there's the breeding success. There's the kids. Uh, this white on the wall is uh, baby kestrel poop. Um, they just shoot it out sideways. It's called spackling. And no one knows quite why they do it, but they think maybe what it does, it might preserve the wood uh, so that the uh, wood lasts longer, uh, so the box can be used for more years. These three eggs are dud eggs. They'll, they're never going to hatch. And that is the end of our, our show. Thanks all, folks. Sil Silica says hi from the dryer. And um, are there any questions? Are there any questions? That was really great, Ralph. Thank you. Okay. Let me get back up here. Uh, let's get this out of the way. Um, so any questions from anyone? No questions? I think you overwhelmed them. Dang, I'm, <laughs> I've never had no questions before. Just type them on in there, folks. Anyone typing? Well, I did it in less than an hour. How do I do that? I usually go over. Well, and it was so much information that maybe they'll watch it again. On they'll watch it again. Well, uh, I, as I say, I work on Seminole State Forest. And if you wish to get hold of me, uh, you can call our number, um, which is 352-589-1762. Uh, That's our visitor center number. And leave me a message. If you want to come out to the forest, I'll give you what info I can. So that number again is 352-589-1762. 1762. Okay, I've just put it in the chat. Right. Um, great. And and uh, you give uh, a trip, a scrub jay trip for the North Shore Breeding Festival each year. Yes, I do. I do that each year. Um, I do. I do a number of of hikes each year. Usually in the spring also, um, I'll do a, um, or not the spring, in the autumn, I'll do a banding demonstration. We'll come out and we'll band some birds together. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I do a lot of stuff um, and I do it for various different Audubon chapters. I've done it for the Seminole, uh, the Seminole County chapter, Sanford chapter. I haven't had a Volusia County chapter out there yet though. I don't know why. I mean, I live in Volusia County and I tell them they can come out. I guess they just don't find me that interesting. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, there's, a, there's a question. Was it the same kestrel box used by the different species? No, actually, it was a number of different kestrel boxes. Um, uh, there, of the kestrel boxes, the 10 we've put up, only three of them uh, have been used by the kestrels and all in the same area. Some of the boxes were, were uh, wishful thinking on my part. I put them up there just in case the kestrel showed up because the habitat was right. Uh, three of them I put up in an area where I had seen kestrels during the breeding season. Uh, so hopefully getting them to breed, but they have not shown up there yet. So um, the the species I've had using the boxes include the uh, eastern flying, southern flying squirrel, excuse me, um, eastern gray squirrels nest in them. Fox squirrels have been in them as well. Um, the eastern screech owl, uh, eastern bluebirds, uh, Carolina wrens, Carolina chickadees, um, uh, tufted titmice, uh, the kestrels, of course, and eastern screech owls have all used the boxes and great crested flycatchers. And that's awesome, linking the habitat and bird species for us, Sandy says. Well, it's very important because birds are all tied to habitat and the habitat has to be healthy for the bird uh, or, or otherwise they disappear. So it, it's we do our best to mimic the natural conditions, to return it to natural conditions as we can. Uh, it's challenging, but we do the best we can because we want the birds around. Uh, for you, for them, and for posterity. Does it work to put up barred owl boxes, and how big do they have to be? Bar it, yeah, barred owls use use boxes, and they need to be a little bit bigger than a kestrel box. So you need a larger opening. Uh, typically, if you um, uh, put up a box that it would be appropriate for wood ducks, a, a barred owl could use it. Uh, though generally, the opening needs to be a little bit bigger, but they can squeeze in. 
Um, and uh, we don't have a need to do that because the barred owls are doing just fine on Seminole without our help. Uh, but if you have in your yard you want to have, uh, or property, if you want to have um, barred owls, yeah, go ahead and put up the boxes. Uh, the question is, what are the cycles of change for the boxes? Um, uh, every year I go through, I'm not quite sure what the question is, but I'll answer it as best I can. Every year in February, I go through and I clean out all the old material in the boxes and add wood chips in the bottom. Uh, sometimes I don't need to because the wood chips are still good or the nesting material is still clean. Uh, but usually I, I'll clean out each box each year before uh, the kestrel nesting season begins. So usually about mid to late February. Uh, and by then, the kestrels are looking at it. They're thinking, okay, I guess should start nesting soon. And they're very happy when they have a nice place to put their eggs. It's important for me to put the chips in there so the eggs can stay in one place and not roll around. Um, the other birds, uh, the eastern screech owls and the great crested flycatchers, everyone else, they usually start nesting a little bit later than the kestrels. Uh, usually in March is when they start nesting. Uh, so um, it's it kind of uh, a serial. A lot of can have, uh, say, for example, uh, Carolina wrens nesting in there early and uh, fledge. And then later in the season, you'll get great crested flycatchers in the same box. So, uh, but um, uh, it's, um, I, I don't evict anyone. If I, if I had, a, say, uh, uh, black rats or Norway rats in there, I'd probably evict them. But if it's a native species, I just let them do what they do. Um, I can always put up more boxes if I need to. And you make them? Uh, I have, I, I can make them. Uh, I've had volunteers make them. Like we had Boy Scouts do it, Eagle Scouts. They made a bunch and put them up. Um, mm -hmm. And then we got some from uh, FWC themselves. They had extras that someone had made for them. They dropped them off. Uh, so um, I, I'll usually target someone who wants to do it for volunteer purposes to put them up. Same thing with our Bluebird boxes. We have a bunch of them up. But if I if I run out of boxes and I can't get some, I can make them. It's it's a fairly easy to design and put them together. Mm -hmm. right. Any other questions? So Delcy says, "Great presentation, thank you." You're and very welcome. Anytime. And what does she say? Thank you. And Laura uh, Taylor says, "Thank you." <laughs> All right, Ralph. Well, terrific, and I think people will be watching this on YouTube. We'll, I'll keep you posted on the of the numbers. <laughs> okay, out outstanding. All right, folks. Have a great evening, and uh, I'll I'll I'm sure I'll be doing another presentation some year in the future. All right. Thanks again. Bye-bye.